that you're planning on joining us at 10:30. The children are going to do their Easter program. It's going to be a it's going to be a blessing for sure. In this passage, the last the last part of Luke chapter one. Uh, this is, we're going to talk about the, the last section. If you look at the, the verse, uh, verse 78, uh, verse 79, excuse me, that's where we're going to end up. And that's the point of the whole text is that he, he came to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about. This is, uh, this is, uh, in the context of what we're, what we've been doing as we've been walking through, uh, uh, Luke in, in the early service. Um, what's going on here is these, this couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth have, uh, they were old. They were past the age of uh, bearing children and an angel came to the angel came to Zechariah as he was ministering in the temple. And he said, it was Gabriel. He said, you're going to, you're going to give birth to a son. Your prayer has been answered. You're going to give birth to a son and you're going to name that son, John. And we're talking about John the Baptist. And so, uh, Zechariah didn't believe at the time he said, how am I supposed to know that this is going to happen? How am I going to know? Cause we're, we're old folks, you know, we're old, probably been praying for a son for many, many years. He's going to be right in the 70, 80 year range. And by that time, folks, or if you, if you hadn't had a child by then, you probably have given up and the angel comes and says, you're going to have this son. His name's going to be, you're going to name him John. And, uh, he says, how am I going to know? And the angel, angel Gabriel said to him, all this is in Luke chapter one. You can go back and read it for yourself. He said, you're going to be mute until the time that these promises come to pass because you did not believe the word of the Lord when it came to him. And all of that took place. And Zechariah was mute for nine months. He was mute for the entire time that his wife Elizabeth was pregnant. And then we saw last week, Elizabeth brought the baby forth. The baby was healthy. They ended up naming him John, just like the angel commanded him to do. And his name was John. He's going to be the John the Baptist that we know from the scripture. That would be the forerunner to the Messiah. And when he named him John, uh, the, his tongue was loose. And that muteness for that uh, he was unable to speak, that silence that he had been in for nine months uh, was gone. And all of a sudden he started able to talk and what came out of him was nine months worth of praise, nine months worth of, of glory in God. Imagine if you had the best news ever to give to someone, the best news, you knew that people all around you, all of Israel, all the people that were going to the temple and offering their sacrifices, offering their prayers, they had been waiting on this event to happen. They'd been waiting on a Messiah to come. They'd been waiting on God to send a deliverer to take them out of their slavery. Uh, they were enslaved to Rome, but more importantly, it says that we're a slave to our sin. They'd been waiting all this time. And Zechariah is the only man that has the news that, Hey, the time has come. It's now been fulfilled. And here we are. We're right on the cusp of this thing. God is bringing forth his deliverer and you can't tell anybody. I guess you could do sign language or you could write it down or you can do charades to try to get people to understand. But for nine months, he has got locked within him, unable to speak. He's got the greatest news that you could ever possibly imagine. Everybody would want to hear this news and he was unable to give it. And after he named the baby John, after all the promises that the angel, God spoke through the angel to Zechariah were fulfilled, his tongue was loosed. For the first time, and what we're going to do today is we're going to look at this song that comes spilling out of him. It comes pouring out of him. Now, well, this is the second song we've looked at. We've looked at Mary's song before in the earlier in chapter one. And, you know, if you're thinking about today, the way we look at songs is it rhymes and it's got meter and all those kind of things. Uh, this is more in line with one of the Psalms that we see in the Bible. But it comes spilling out of Zechariah, this song of praise. These are the words. Words that are spoke. If you look in verse 65, it says where it says, uh, it says, and fear came on all that dwelt around them. And all these sayings is talking about the sayings that are coming out of Zechariah were noised abroad throughout the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, what manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And then in verse 67 through 77 or 79, excuse me, 
Those are the words that were noised abroad. People, these are the things that Zechariah said that caused people to sit up and say, Wow, what kind of child is this going to be? What are the events that are going on here? And so that's what we're going, that's what we're going to look at. And what I want you to see is before we even begin, I'm going to tell you where we're going. So you kind of know which, which direction we're going in. What Zechariah is going to do is he's going to give a praise of God and he's going to give a prophecy about what is going to happen, about what God has done, about how God has done it and why God has done it. Now, for right off the bat, you already know pretty much everything I'm going to say, uh, especially if you live around here. If you live down the south, the Bible Belt, you've heard this story. I mean, you you probably didn't come into Easter Sunday to a church and, and think, you know, wow, they're going to tell me something I've, I've probably never heard before. Pretty much. I imagine, you know where we're going. We're going to talk about Jesus's death. We're going to talk about his resurrection. We're going to talk about the payment that he made for sin. We're going to talk about all those kind of things. But what I need you to do is I need you for just a moment, for just a short period of time. I want you to pretend like you have no idea what is going to happen. You have no idea that you've ever heard this story before. And you will get the sense of what Zechariah was so excited about. You'll get the sense of these people uh, were waiting for this promise for so long, it had been, we talked about this before, it had been 400 years at the beginning of the Gospels in the New Testament since God had sent a prophet, since God had spoken through anything, anybody, other than he had the Old Testament prophets that had, were written down, they had the Old Testament scriptures, but God had sent no word for 400 years, and all of a sudden, here it was, the time is fulfilled, it's now, it's going to happen right now, we're living, if you were Zechariah, and the people around Zechariah, you would be so excited. We're living in the time that this is going to happen for, for just a moment. Just act like you're looking at this whole situation that Zechariah is going to explain to us with brand new eyes, with brand new eyes, as if you'd never seen it before. And you'll get the, you'll get the excitement that we should have knowing who Jesus is and the salvation that we live under and the resurrection that we live by, that we are accepted by God that we are forgiven of our sins because of what Jesus did on the cross. It's a, it's really a, a, the main thing that I want you to see is that when you and I, because we've probably heard the story so many times, we've probably heard it ever since we were little children, all grown up uh, being told uh, the old, old story about Jesus and who he was and what he's done because we've heard it so many times. It's easy for us to take it for granted. It's easy for us to take for granted the fact that we have have uh, this truth locked up in the scripture. We have this truth that we live in, that we are accepted by God. If we repent of our sin and we trust in Jesus and give him our lives, we are accepted by God. It's easy to let the things that are most common to us, the things that we know so well, the things that we've heard over and over and over again, it's easy to get used to them. It's easy to, uh, to take them for granted. You and I, the people that are closest to us are the ones we usually take for granted. We put on the smiley face and we, we act real nice around folks that uh, maybe we don't know so well or maybe that don't know us so well, but the ones that we know closest, our husbands, our wives, our brothers, our sisters, our family members, those are the ones we don't really, you know, we don't really put those smiles on all the time. We usually, uh, uh, we usually just relax and, and be ourselves, and we, we end up taking a lot of that, a lot of those things for granted. So what I want you to see is if you look at this with new eyes, it will, it will, um, it will, it will let you understand the joy that we live in, the, the excitement that we live in, knowing not just on Easter Sunday, but every day of every year, if you are in Christ, you're free. You've been freed from sin. You've been free from death. It doesn't have any hold over you. So I'm getting way ahead of myself. Let's, let's go ahead and read the text and see what, uh, what God has done. We're going to look at what God has done for us. We're going to look at how God's done for us. And we're going to look at why he has done it for us. So it says, and his father, Zechariah, verse 67, he was filled with the Holy Ghost and he prophesied, saying, the first thing that comes out of his mouth, the first thing after nine months of silence that comes out of his mouth is blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. We're going to see today that he gives not only just a great 
shout of praise, a great uh, song of praise, but he gives a prophecy as well. It's not just Zechariah excited going, you know, woohoo, Jesus is going to come. This, uh, the time of fulfillment, the time of salvation is here. This is going to be the Holy Spirit filling Zechariah and spilling all of this out. You can imagine his family is shocked. This guy has been silent for nine months. He's been silent and, you know, I don't know if you were, you were around, you'd probably think, well, he's not ever going to be able to talk again. I don't know what happened to Zechariah, but the guy just all of a sudden couldn't talk. He came out of the temple one day and he saw something. We don't know what it was, but all of a sudden he just, he never spoke another word. And then all of a sudden the baby is named John. He writes it on a tablet. He will be named John and his tongue is loosed and this song of praise. This prophecy comes flowing out of him and what he's going to foretell to the people that are around him is what God has done, what he's doing and how he's going to do it. And not only that, but why. And it's so important for us. We know the old, old story. We you, you could probably tell me what God has done. It's not a big leap. We know it. You could probably tell me how he has done it. The important thing for us is going to be why the effect of what that means in your life and my life. And so the first thing he does is tells us what that he's done. He says, the first line is blessed be the Lord God of Israel. That's something that David said twice in the old Testament. It's something Solomon said that exact same phrase, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. So he is in line with the same men who foretold all these things throughout the scripture. He says, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. And this is what he has done. He has visited and redeem his people. When you see the word visited in the Old Testament, uh, it's not just, you know, you're going to have today, you're probably eating Easter dinner, Easter lunch, whatever it is, or Easter supper tonight. You're going to come with all your family. You might have people coming in from out of town that are going to visit with you. It's not that kind of visited. Every time you see the word visited, where God visited his people, you're going to see deliverance coming. You're going to see help coming. It said that God visited his people in Egypt. What did he do? He didn't come just stick his knees up under the table and say, Hey, I'm here to hang out with y'all. He came and delivered them out of Egypt. He said, it says over and over again, every time his people were in trouble, every time his people were, uh, uh, oppressed, every time they were captive to another people, every time that they cried out to God, God came and the Bible says he visited his people. Even Jesus, when he was riding his donkey into, uh, last week was Palm Sunday, when he was riding his donkey into Jerusalem, he mourned over Jerusalem and he said, why? Because you did not recognize the time of, vi- of your visitation. He came, God came to deliver us. He came and visited us. The scripture foretells God with us, Emmanuel, he will come down and be with us. He will come and redeem us. That's the second thing it says in that verse. He redeemed us. What that means, that word redeemed means that he purchased you. He bought you. He, it's a picture of you going on to a slave block and buying a person, buying a slave out of the marketplace, buying someone and, uh, and bringing them into your household. That's what it means to be redeemed. We use that word in church all the time. You know, I've been redeemed. We sing songs about being redeemed. But what that means is that Christ has paid the price for you. It means God has purchased you. You have been redeemed. You've, you've been redeemed. Now it's something that we take for granted over and over again, because we don't remember we have a, we have a tendency. I have a tendency and you have a tendency to forget where you come from. You have a tendency to forget from where God has brought you from. The Bible says that when you don't know Christ, when you are out in the world on your own, without God, without hope, you are a slave to sin. You are a slave to death. It ho- It is a, a cloud that holds over you. I don't care how healthy you are. I don't care how much you exercise or how well you eat. Death's coming for you. I, I'm a hospital chaplain. I work on the eighth and ninth floor. I can promise you healthy people die the same way that, that unhealthy people do. Only if you're he- real healthy, you, you end up dying of nothing. You're just old and you die. So you are going to die and you can't get away from the fact that death is coming. And after death, the judgment, 
You can't get away from it. I don't care how fast you run. I don't care where you go. I don't care what you try to occupy your life with. If you invest yourself in your job or in your work to try to pull meaning out of that, to give you purpose in life, you know what? When at the end of the day, in the darkness of the night, when you pull the covers up around your neck, death is still going to be there. It's still going to be waiting for you. You can't run fast enough. You can't run far enough. You can't get away from it. It's always going to be there. I remember the time you probably, some of y'all have heard this story before. When I was in college, I remember exactly where I was. I remember exactly what I was doing. I was studying microbiology for an exam that I had. I hate microbiology. But anyway, I was working really hard and the thought came to me, why are you doing this? Why are you even doing this? You know, and of course, I'm like everybody else. I want to graduate. Well, why is it that you want to graduate? Well, uh, I want to get a good job. You know, I want to have money. I want to be able to support myself and have a house and have insurance and get married and all those kind of things. Well, why is it that you want to have a good job? Well, because I want to retire early. You know, I want to be able to live a good life and have, you know, ease and comfort and have fun in my old age, you know, and not have to uh, strain and work so hard all my life. And the thought came, well, why don't you just skip all this other stuff and do that right now? And I thought, that's a good idea. So I left. I left college. I left the whole deal behind. And I was a musician at the time. And so I just went and made money playing musician. Just lived it up. Did what I wanted to do. And I, I did exactly what I wanted to do whenever I wanted to do it. I didn't have any rules. Didn't have any anything uh, hindering me. And you know what? At the end of the day, when I pulled the covers around my neck at night and laid my head on the pillow, you know what was still waiting for me? Death still coming. I don't care if you if you if you study and make an A in microbiology and valedictorian of your college class and have a great the greatest job that that is ever known to mankind. Death is still coming for you. If you skip all that, do what I did for a long time and just say, you know what, I'm going to go play music for a living. I'm just going to do that and live it up and just have a good time and live for me. You know what? Death is still coming. And after death, the judgment. There's no way to escape it. There's no way to get out of it. There's, it's always going to be there. I have a picture of it in my head and I don't know if I'll be able to convey this to you, but it's like a, it's like a, I get this picture of a man being chased down by a lion or a panther or, or some fast animal, some fast predator. And it's always going to be at your heels. Always. It's going to be chasing you down no matter what. And the best that you and I can do, the best that we can do is just put it out of your mind. Just not think about it. Ch- you know, change the channel. I'm going to think about fishing. I'm going to think about shopping. I'm going to think about work. I'm going to think about family. I'm just going to put it out of my mind and I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to change the channel and look the other way. But every now and again, you're going to get a glimpse that it's still right there. It's still right over your head. It's still hanging over your head. That cloud is coming. It's coming and it's going to have you. It's going to have you are going to die. I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever, you probably have, but I don't know if you've ever recognized that you are going to die. I can remember the earliest one, the earliest memories that I have was uh, as a little bitty child. I mean, I'm, I'm probably talking three or four years old. I, it's just a foggy memory that I have. I don't remember where it was or anything, but I remember my parents taking me to a relative's funeral. And, you know, you do the thing where you walk up to the casket and it's a visitation, that kind of thing. And I remember, I don't know who it was. I don't know where it was. But I remember, it's just a foggy childhood memory. I remember walking up to the casket and looking at this dead person. It's probably an uncle or cousin or something like that. And I remember crying for days. I don't want to die. I don't want to end up in a casket. I don't want to end up in a funeral home. I don't want to end up like that. Death is our enemy. It's not supposed to be that way. It never was supposed to be that way. We were never created to die. All that came from the fall. It came from sin. It came from uh, the, the wickedness in our hearts. And that is the consequence. And it's a consequence that we deserve. But God came to buy us back from that. He came to redeem us in such a way that we are on the slave block, slaves to our sin, slaves to death, 
Understanding that that cloud is coming. That panther behind us is always nipping at our heels. It doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are, you are going to die. And every time that you, every time that, that reality focuses in on you, the best you can do if you don't know Christ is to just turn the channel and, and try to focus on something else, try to find purpose, meaning in your life, in some other thing. But every time reality comes back to haunt you, comes back and hits you right in the face, you turn around and there it is. You go to Hawaii on vacation and you turn around, get back to normal and there it is. It's waiting for you. You can't run far enough or fast enough to get away from it. It'll always be a cloud hanging over your head. You're slave to it. And that's what he came to do. He came to purchase you back from death. He came to take the sting of death away. He came to take the victory of the grave away. He came to redeem you and purchase you for himself so that you and I could live eternally in the heavens forever with those who have gone on before us and more importantly with Jesus Christ himself. That death that is following us around all the time, it has no power. It has no power when Christ is redeemed. So that's what what God has done. He's done it in accord with what he has always said would come to pass. He told us if you read scripture as a whole, you can see in the very beginning in Genesis, when uh, Adam and Eve fell, God promised a seed would come. A seed of the woman would come and he would crush the head of the serpent. And then he said the same thing, the promise uh, to Abraham, you know, through you, all the earth would be blessed. And then again, he said it to David. And then all through the prophets, you can see them foretelling this time when God would bring salvation, when he would come and visit his people when he would come and bring this redemption and deliver them from the chains of death and hell and the grave. He would deliver them from being slaves to sin. And now here is Zechariah saying, all of that is here. It's all come to pass. Everything that we've been waiting for from the Garden of Eden to Abraham, David, to all the prophets that we study, this is what Zechariah would say. All of that, the time is now. It is coming now. It's happening now. It's exciting news to Zechariah. God has brought redemption for you and for I. Understand that you and I still live in the same creation that they lived in. You and I still live with the same sin that they had. You and I still live with the same cloud of death in the grave that is following us around everywhere we go, that we can't escape, that we can't run from, that we can't hide from, that we can't mask, we can't gloss over. But God has visited us and he has brought redemption for us. That's what God has done. That's what he's done. How's he going to do it? We know how he's going to do it, but Zechariah is telling. He's prophesying how this is going to happen. Verse 69 says, And he hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. It's going to be Zechariah's prophesying. Remember, this is before uh, this is before Jesus's birth. This is right at John the Baptist's birth. He says he has he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David. It's going to be a person. It's going to be a person is what he's saying. It's a person from the lineage of David. It's a person that's going to be raised up in the house of David. Now, you you probably don't remember this, but as we looked at Zechariah and Elizabeth, when we were first introduced to them, as they were, you know, he was in the temple and it was told to him that he would be uh, the father of, of the baby that he would call John. It was told to us in Luke chapter one, you can go back and read it later, that both Zechariah and Elizabeth were of the house of Aaron. They were priests. They were from the line of the priests that had come. So what Zechariah is prophesying here is not that this baby here that he's having, John the Baptist, is going to be this horn of salvation. It's going to be this one that's going to deliver. He's saying God is raising up one from the house of David. It's a person 
that is bringing salvation. Of course, we know from the house of David, it's going to be Jesus Christ. It's going to be the son of Mary. It's going to be God, Emmanuel, God with us from the line of David. But a lot of times we get that a little mixed up, even here in the modern time. It's a person who saves you. Of course, it's God and man. It's Jesus Christ. But it's a person who saves you. Sometimes we get caught up in a plan. We get caught up in thinking, well, you know, I've done what I was supposed to do. I remember Easter Sunday way back in, man, I wish I could remember the date. It was, it was Easter Sunday. I was 11 years old. I'm 43 now. So you just do the math later. 11 years old. I can remember walking down an aisle. I did what I was supposed to do. You're supposed to walk down an aisle, ain't you? I mean, that's in second opinion somewhere. You're supposed to walk down an aisle. You're supposed to pray with the preacher. I don't remember what, I don't remember what the preacher said. I don't remember what he was preaching on. I don't remember what I said. I don't remember anything about it. I wasn't saved when I was 11. I was saved when I was 29. But here's the thing. I did what I was supposed to do. I was trusting in a plan. I was trusting in I'm supposed to do this X, Y, and Z. That's not salvation. Salvation is when you trust in a man, trust in a person, God and man as one, Jesus Christ. I'm not trusting, you know, a lot of times we get that mixed up. I'm not trusting in what I've done. I'm not trusting in have I fulfilled my end of the bargain. I don't have an end. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do to save myself. There's nothing I can do to maintain my salvation. There's nothing I can do. All I can do is cast all of my worries, all of my fears, and all of my faith onto this person, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that died for my sins and rose from the grave. All I can do is trust that he is who he said he was and that he will do what he said he will do. So when I stand before the throne in judgment, as you will, as soon as you die, it says there is a uh, point a man wants to die. And then the judgment, when I stand before him, when you stand before him, the only thing that I can say, the only thing I have on my case, the only evidence at the trial, so to speak, that I could present is that this person, Jesus Christ, God and man, died for my sins and rose from the grave for my justification. That's all you have. You're trusting in a person. You're trusting that he is who he said he was. You're trusting that he is able, abundantly able to save those who call upon him. You're trusting that he is able to appease the wrath of the father by his death and his resurrection. He is able to do what he said he had come to do. He's able to save you and you are trusting in him. You're trusting in who he is. You're trusting in what he's done. He said he's here. He's going to raise up this uh, uh, this horn of salvation, this this power of salvation in the house of David. Uh, this person has been foretold all in the Old Testament. Isaiah, I've, I've already said it once or twice already. Isaiah chapter nine, verse six and seven. Talk about Emmanuel. God with us. It said, God, the father will give him the throne of David. He'll reign on the throne of David. If you remember, you can go back and look it up later in Luke chapter one. That's exactly what Gabriel told Mary. God will give him the throne of his father, David. He's talking about Jesus Christ here. We are redeemed through a person. But here's the most important part I want you to see. We've seen what he has done. We've seen how he's going to do it. And those are things that you know already. But a lot of us don't understand why he has saved us. Why? When I say why, what I mean is what's the purpose What effect does it have on my life? What does it look like? Why did God redeem us? It's going to show us here in verse 71. It says that so that so that we should be saved from our enemies and from the land and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. There's three things, three things that we see in them verses. Why has he done what he's done? What effect does it have in your life? What effect does salvation have in your life? It's easy. It says 
He's done this to save us from the hand of our enemies. You probably have lots of enemies. All of us do in, in the in the form of people. You might have people that hate you. You might have you're going to have people that hate you if you're in Christ. But what more importantly, what we're talking about here is we're talking about the enemies that we have principalities and powers and rulers in high places. We're talking about all those things that come against you. They are seeking your destruction. They're seeking to keep you from knowing this Jesus. They want you to be happy in other stuff, in fun, in, in comforts, in worldly pleasures, in work, in family, in, in all of these things. If they can keep you content just doing the things that you're doing, running around after worldly things, then guess what? You'll spend, you'll spend a life that's, you know, basically, uh, just living for things around here and you'll die and you'll spend eternity in hell. Not because you're a bank robber, a serial killer, or, or as bad as the guy down the road, but because you do not have have the righteousness of Christ. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And one sin, just one tiny infraction of God's law makes you a debtor to the whole law. And when you stand before God, he's not like a judge here that can wink his eye and say, you know what, I'm going to go easy on you. He's a perfect judge. And that perfect judge is going to judge perfectly. That is part of God's nature is perfection. And so he can't just say, you know what, I'm feeling pretty good today. I'm just going to let you off. His justice, because he's perfect and holy and righteous and just and a perfect judge, his justice demands satisfaction for every sin. And so you and I are hopeless if if we stand before him. The things that we think, the thoughts that run through our mind on a day-to-day basis are going to be brought up as evidence against us. There's going to be an accuser there that's accusing you of sin, saying this person is not worthy. They're not holy. They're not able to come into your presence. Look at the life of this person. They have done all of these things. There's no way that you can accept this person. All of these things are going to be brought up, but Jesus paid for all of those things. So the only way that we can stand before him and be righteous and holy and accepted in his presence is if we have a substitute, a perfect substitute that stood in our place, that took all the punishment and the justice that we deserve and gave us all the righteousness and the holiness that we can't give ourselves, that we can't do ourselves. The only way that we can stand is to have someone stand for us who is perfect and holy and righteous. And there's only one person who met the qualifications that it takes to save you. And that was Jesus Christ, God and man. That's the only person who's offered to save you. And so it says we should be saved from the hands of all of our enemies. The Bible says that we don't war against flesh and blood. We war against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. Make no mistake. Satan and the world are at war with you. Now, you can forget the Hollywood thing where, you know, you got whatever Satan's biting you in your sleep and rattling pots in your, in your kitchen at three in the morning. Or you forget all that. What he's doing is whispering in your ear and he's saying, you know, you don't deserve this. You can have this. It's OK. It's not that big a deal. Did God really say that you can't do? He's whispering in your ear and the only thing that he wants, he wants you to be happy. He wants you to be content, but he wants you to be content in the things of this world. If he can keep you there, he's got you. Slave to sin. Don't think that Satan's minions and his his people are, are just the guys running around with black fingernails and and you know, lighting fires and sacrificing goats and all those kind of things. Satan's people are what we would say look like good people. They go to work. They come home, they try to feed their family. They're just trying to make it. They're trying to live their life and be good. And the only, the only thing that makes them unacceptable before the Father is the same thing that you and I have. It's sin within us. Everything that we do, the Bible says that any righteousness that we try to do on our own without the righteousness of Christ is just filthy rags. It doesn't, it doesn't stand up. There's nothing you and I can do to merit any goodness before God. Now think about that for a minute. I say this all the time. What that means is right now, as you sit here, if you were to take your last breath 
And then in a moment, you'd be standing before the judgment of God. You will either be 100% perfect and righteous in Jesus Christ. Or you will be absolutely and perfectly wicked and condemned. There's no middle ground. There's no, well, I'm doing better than I used to be. Uh, shoo, I sure am not as bad as I, a uh, person as I used to be. So God's going to take all that into account. You're either perfect in Christ Jesus, not because I'm perfect here, not because I'm doing everything right, not because I'm sinless. Of course I'm not, but because Jesus gave me his righteousness by dying and rising from the grave, I'm either, you're either perfect in him Or you are completely and totally without goodness, never done anything. Even if you've gone and, you know, you can go and feed the homeless. You can go and help your neighbor. You can go and do all the good deeds you can possibly imagine. But they do not cancel out breaking of God's law. It'd be like standing. I don't know how many of y'all have ever stood before a judge. Uh, Don't raise your hand, but I can go ahead and tell you that I have. When you stand before a judge accused of a crime, The judge is not going to take your good works into account. If you've done, if you've broken the law and you're guilty and you're standing there about to be sentenced, the judge doesn't care if you helped an old lady across the street. He doesn't care if you've been good for most of your life and you really help your mom and you're really sacrificing for your family and you're he doesn't care. He has to, as a judge, his job is to punish you for the crime that you have committed. And all the good that you've done all the way up until your life is not going to be brought in as evidence. If a person commits murder just once, he probably ought not stand up in front of the judge and say, I only did it once. I've been 43 years and I only did it once. I mean, surely you got to take that into account. No, he's not going to take that into account. He's going to sentence you for what you have done. All the good that you could possibly do is not going to remove not one sin on your account. It's not not one sin because God is a perfect judge. And so what it says here is that he has done this. He has sent his son so that we would be saved from our enemies. We would be saved from those who seek to destroy us. And later on, we're going to talk about, he's going to say the forgiveness of sins. So he's not just talking about people and armies and those kind of things. He's talking about the slavery to sin. He's talking about the enemies that want to keep us away from God, keep us away from his righteousness. He's come to save us. Now you may be thinking, I'm not doing good. I'm not doing good at all. I haven't done well in any of this. I'm, I'm failing every day. I'm, I, I've lost so many battles. I've done so much wrong. Yeah, you have. And so have I, and so is everybody else. But understand what he's saying. It doesn't say that we would be better at fighting our enemies. It doesn't say that we would, that we would be able to fight better against our enemies. It says he's done this so that we would be saved. From our enemies. That means there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no, the ordinances that were against you have been nailed to the cross, the Bible says. It says that he triumphed over all the principalities and powers, putting them to open shame by dying on a cross. He has saved you. So when you in Christ, if you are in Christ, stand before God, stand before the Father today. If you take your last breath today, you might say, you know, I'm terrible. I've done all kinds of things. The father would look at you and say, the only thing that I see is the blood of my son that has covered you and the righteousness that he has given you. You have nothing on your account. You have been saved from those enemies. They can make accusation all day long. They can say things that are true. Did you see Jason yesterday? Man, he really messed up bad. He really sinned against God. They can make all kinds of accusations in the court of the father, but none of them can stick because we have been saved from those enemies. We've been, we've been justified by the grace of God in him dying on the cross and rising again. That justice has been paid. If you've ever been in front of a court, and again, don't raise your hand, but I promise you that I've been in front of a court. If you've ever been in front of a court and you've been acquitted of a crime, you cannot be brought back into court for that same crime. If you've been acquitted of a judge and jury has acquitted you, you can't be brought. Don't ask me why I was in court, but I'm just telling you, I I know. It says 
You can't be acquit, you can't be tried for the same thing. And so when the accusers come before God and they say, there's no way you can accept this guy. There's no way you can accept this lady. Look at what they did yesterday. Look at what they did before. They, that can't even be brought into the trial because justice has already been poured out on the head of Jesus Christ for that crime. All the sins that you've done, all the sins that you will do have been poured out upon the head of Christ. If you have trusted in him and he, his Holy Spirit is imparted to you, you've been born again. Those things have been justified. They have been paid for and they will never be brought back up. The Bible says that he cast them as far as the east is from the west. The, one of the reasons why he's done what he's done is to save us from our enemies. I, I better hurry up. I'm not going to get done. Oh, it's nine o'clock already. All right, real quick. Listen fast and I'll go fast. The second thing that he's done is to keep his word. It said the same to perform what he promised to the fathers. God is always going to keep his word. He swore by himself when there was no one greater to swear by that he would do it. And he has done it. He brought it about. And the, the, the last thing we see in verse 74 and 75 is he saved you so that you could serve him. He saved you so that you could serve. He didn't save you. He didn't deliver you to do your own thing. So you'd be free to hang out in the recliner. So you'd be free to go and, and, you know, enjoy the things of the world and the sins of the flesh and the sins of all the things. He didn't free you to do that. He bought you. If he redeemed you, he bought you. You've been bought with a price. And now your body is not your own. It's a temple of the Holy Spirit. He freed you so you could serve him without fear. You could serve it. Why would you serve it? It's not as if you're serving, walking on eggshells. So I got to serve real good. Otherwise, God's going to drop me off at the next stop and he's not going to take me all the way. I got to serve real good. Otherwise, God's not going to be pleased with me. I got to do all my best. I got to do everything I can. No, we serve him without fear because it's already been done. We're not trying to win anything. We're not trying to earn anything. We're not trying to, we're not trying to, to maintain our salvation or our standing with God. We have been given that standing and we serve him now without fear, without fear of losing anything because we serve him in holiness and righteousness. It says in verse, um, in verse 74, 75, it says we are to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him All the days of our life. Let me just skim through these last four verses because I have so run out of time. It says, and thou, he switches. He's talked about what God has done. And now he's going to switch and prophesy over his son. This John, John the Baptist, who we would would later be called. He's going to say, and thou child, talking to John, you shall be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord. This is what John's going to do. He's going to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sin. He is going to prepare God's people. He's going to he's going to prepare God's ways. He's going to give knowledge of salvation. What was John's message? Anybody know his entire message, the entire message that John preached? It was repent and believe the one who is coming, which we know is Jesus Christ. He said, there's one coming that I'm not worthy to tie his shoelaces. He's going to come. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. He's going to come save you. He, he saw John the Baptist saw Jesus coming and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. His entire message was repent of your sin and believe in the gospel. That's the same message that you and I have for us today. Today. You have to repent of your sin and you have to trust in Christ. Otherwise, the cloud of death is going to be over you for the entirety of your life. It's going to chase you. It's going to follow you. You will always be subject to it. You will never get away from it. You'll never be able to turn from it, hide from it. You'll you'll never be able to work your way so you don't have to think about it. The best you can do is just think about something else. Push it out of your mind. The best you can do is just try to distract yourself and busy yourself with something else in life. The best you can do is just not think about it. But it'll always be there. 
It'll always be there. Sin will always be there. God told Cain when he killed, when, before he killed his brother Abel, he said, he said, if you do well, won't you be accepted? He says, but sin is crouching at the door and its desire is to have you. It's the picture of a predator about to pounce and it's always chasing you. It's always there. You'll never get away from it ever unless Christ takes the sting of death from you. Unless Christ takes the victory of death in the grave away. And he is offered to do that. The same message John preached is the same message you and I have to hear today. Repent of your sin, which means to turn away from your sin. Repent of your good works. And trust in Jesus, the only one who could save you. Father, we love you. We thank you today for your word. Thank you for all that you've given us, God. I